Great. Uh, well, I think we are live today. Uh, uh, welcome to Virginia Tech's uh, BIT Cyber Program Guest Speaker Series. Uh, we're really excited today to kick off the fall semester here uh, with uh, an outstanding uh, uh, guest to speak to us uh, about uh, his career in cybersecurity uh, and, and uh, about some of the um, greatest concerns as we look forward at, uh, to the cyber challenges uh, in our um, emerging technology economy uh, and uh, in the uh, uh, geopolitical sense as well. Uh, I, I spent all day today and yesterday uh, at an exciting conference. It was the innovation conference that is done annually with all of the federal agencies that uh, uh, have grant money to give towards uh, business research, it's uh, SBIRs and uh, STTIs for, for, for those that aren't aware. Every single federal agency from Department of Defense to Intelligence to Coast Guard to NOAA to Department of Transportation, Health and Human Services to Agriculture are all talking about smart cities. They're all talking about, okay, we're going to do things better, faster, cheaper at the edge now because of the amazing things that are coming down the pipeline from the intersection of 5G wireless technologies and this availability of data at the edge, the ability to sense, make sense, and then act, but all to a mission area, to a business unit said, we gotta solve cybersecurity in stream with this. We uh, would cannot responsibly deploy these new capabilities uh, without proactively addressing cybersecurity risk. So you guys are in the exact right place, the exact right program to be out in front of that very significant need. We've known cyber has been hot for some time. It's gonna get hotter as those uh, non-IT areas all begin to discover and realize that uh, they need to pay attention and address uh, cybersecurity. That's why I'm so excited tonight to have with us Greg Crabb. Uh, uh, Greg was the CISO for one of the largest companies in the world. And it just happened to be the US Postal Service, <laughs> which is a business, it really is, right? And increasingly we expect right. them to compete with FedEx and with uh, 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 parts of Amazon, uh, uh, you know, bringing new uh, services to citizens, uh, but also doing so in a competitive way. And Greg was right at the forefront of that, leading that business transformation for the U.S. Postal Service, and was given the tough task of addressing cybersecurity risks as they made that pivot to online services uh, and information-based uh, uh, services for their, their functions that weren't online, right? Their physical uh, uh, services that depend on information. So uh, uh, without, uh, delaying at all, I'd like to uh, go uh, right into uh, uh, Greg, uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, if you could uh, introduce yourself, give us a sense, Greg, of uh, who, who you are, uh, and then we'll get into the US Postal Service experience. Yeah, thank you, David. And I should say, Professor Simpson, um, really grateful to have the opportunity to uh, address students here today. And uh, so much of what you just entered with uh, is a great example of the types of challenges that I've felt, uh, dealt with every day as a chief information security officer for the United States Postal Service. And, you know, our steps into the future. Uh, tomorrow, I'm speaking about artificial intelligence and machine learning in security operations and the importance of, of those technologies. And, you know, when I was at the Postal Service, I was talking about how we were going to bring AI and ML to the edge relative to uh, improving package delivery and uh, also uh, our smart cities work. We had been doing a lot of work with uh, uh, the automotive industry around imaging the streets. The postal carriers drive every street in the United States uh, six days a week. And so we were actually equipping uh, uh, delivery trucks with cameras to be able to uh, capture all of the, uh, not only cameras, but LIDAR and other technologies to capture all of that imagery and bring that uh, uh, from the edge into uh, into big data stores to be able to help uh, the future of uh, uh, autonomous 
vehicles. So really excited to be here today. I, I uh, had a near 30 year government career and I look forward to sharing some of my key principles relative to my career. And then uh, I'll talk about the the wild ride that I had in protecting the uh, the 2020 election and all of the threats and vulnerabilities and issues that were necessary in order to be able to to make that one of the safest uh, elections that had ever been run in the United States. So thanks for having me, uh, Professor Simpson. Great, uh, great. Thanks so much. And I love that you let off early with LIDAR, right? Light <laughs> detection and ranging, right? Cybersecurity isn't just IT. It's this network of systems of systems that uh, we pull together to get useful things done, to create business advantage, uh, uh, to uh, address missionaries, to do better, faster, cheaper uh, 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 across all of the business units that, that come together to uh, uh, bring together uh, products and services. Um, uh, Greg, talk to us a little bit about how you came to cyber. What 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 led you down this path? So um, I like to talk about service. And for me, uh, I uh, decided that early on that my career was going to be of service to the nation. Uh, my po my grandfather taught me about the importance of the United States Postal Service. He was a letter ca carrier in a in a small town in southern Ohio, and uh, I used to love walking the, the streets of this small town because everybody loved Grandpa yeah. because he connected. You know, he he was the letter carrier in the nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties. Uh, they actually used to deliver mail two times a day back then uh, because that was the only way that that folks could communicate. And Grandpa had connected that community. And my father went on to, to work for the FBI and for the United States Postal Inspection Service. And I, I felt that, you know, my career uh, needed to be of public service and uh and felt that strong mission of uh, giving back to you know this amazing country. Uh, so I uh, started off like many of you uh, uh, in in high school. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I had a strong aptitude for math. And at the time, this was the late '80s. I uh, a good career path was accounting. I had taken an accounting class in high school. I was extremely proficient in that course. It was easy. I was like, if accounting is this easy, why don't I just run down that path, right? And so, uh, you know, people didn't have, you know, we had uh, Atari video games, if people, if you even know what an Atari video game was, but we didn't have personal computers largely back in the late eighties. And so uh, I went to community college. Uh, I lived in Northern Illinois and uh, there's a community college in Northern Illinois called College of DuPage. And I knew that I wanted to get through this experience as quickly as possible um, because I wanted to really get out and contribute. And so I did the, the, the two-year associate's degree in 18 months um, and then transferred immediately to, to the four-year school that I ultimately graduated with uh, a bachelor's in accounting. And uh, that was another Northern Illinois college. It's called North Central College uh, uh, in the suburbs of Chicago. And uh, with an accounting degree, uh, getting into public service was very uh, easy. Uh, I uh, uh, There was a, a demand for auditors. I, I spent the first couple of years of my career at the uh, United States Department of Energy uh, as a uh, an auditor for them. And then I transitioned. I, I had a strong desire to be a federal law enforcement officer and followed somewhat in my father's footsteps to become a federal uh, agent with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. And uh, the, the Postal Inspection Service is a, uh, a 
uh, a law enforcement agency of about uh, 1,400 agents. And uh, we investigate mail theft, mail fraud, bombs in the mail. And I had the unique path of being able to focus on cyber crimes. And I can get into a lot more detail about that. Uh, I'm putting the link for the Postal Inspection Services website in the chat so uh, folks can uh, research it, what it, that it's is. important point, right? That, that at some point, mail fraud, which used to be uh, something that you would put something in an envelope, you send it, you dupe a unsuspecting citizen uh, through fraudulent use of uh, of, of mail or, or maybe the money orders or those kinds of things. Exactly. It it has become uh, electronic fraud, uh, right? There's this electronic crumbs, uh, and uh, so it, it, your your journey to me is is just perfect because it really helps illustrate there are a lot of work roles in cyber. Right, the, the, and some of them are forensic, uh, and in the uh, IG or, or the more investigatory side of things, it, it's it's like an old mill mill fraud uh, uh, investigation, right? You, you're Absolutely. more efficiently today uh, looking at electronic indicators, big data of of what might reveal that there's indications of fraud going on, uh, and then you can organize a cyber hunt uh to uh, uh, either validate the assumption that those anomalies are fraudulent or uh, validate the, the the counter that it's not um it, it's it, how, how then i imagine you were really on the pioneering the front end of uh bringing uh, those um true cyber capabilities to the postal ig yeah absolutely so um i i began with the Postal Inspection Service in late 1995 and was assigned to one of our data centers. And I had an audit responsibility for the first several years of my career. And at the time, they referred to it as the electronic data processing controls portion of the financial statement audit for the Postal Service. And so I was uh, doing the basically the internal audit work uh, at the time, I obviously knew how to do audits. I didn't have a strong proficiency in the technology aspects. However, uh, you know, one of the things that I really uh, found that was a competency of mine was being able to assimilate a lot of technology information, uh, understanding big data, and uh, basically taught myself in uh, on nights and weekends about mainframe computing. Uh, the Postal Service had a had a mainframe that did all of the accounting controls for accounts receivable, accounts payable, all of those aspects of, of the financial statements. And my responsibility was to protect, uh, assure the proper implementation of security controls for uh, all of the financial statement uh, uh, control objectives that were necessary to be be uh, uh, examined from access control to disaster recovery and everything in between. Um, but I think that um, really th those there was a couple of years there from from ninety five to ninety nine where I did those uh, computer audits, computer system audits which really got me ingrained in thinking about cybersecurity controls, the importance of those controls to protect the technology assets of an organization and really presenting risk, uh, 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 risk decisions to the organization to be made uh, in order to best protect those technologies. So that was really early on are inherently business decisions, right? I, I, I mean, Absolutely. I mean, to address cybersecurity risk proactively, at some point, you're either putting people's time on it, which costs money, or you're buying something new, which costs money, or you're uh, outsourcing to a, a, a company that can help you, which costs money, uh, or you're accepting risk, uh, which has its own cost, right? You, there, there's, there's a real uh, uh, quantization of uh, accepted risk uh, a, a, as well. Um, did you find that your business background uh, inherently allowed you to 
look at cyber risk in a way that was maybe different from some of the more technical folks that came to this through the computer path? Oh, absolutely. Because I understood the impacts to the financial statements, I can I had a strong I have have a strong ability to articulate the business value of a particular set of investments and be able to look at those from an options perspective and recognize that uh, the business decisions need to be made. I don't get emotional about a business decision. You know, I present the facts, articulate the risks, and present it to the CFO or the leadership team to have them make uh, decisions on, you know, where to go with the particular uh, technology path that that's best suited for the organization. And, and you can't drive risk down to zero, right? That that's, that's something that uh, many engineers just never can work with. Yeah, there's no. Of course, we can close that. No, you're not going to be able to afford ever to drive risk to zero. And if you think you can, you don't really understand the risk <laughs> that's uh, presented to your company. Greg, take us from uh, your role then to. Uh, becoming the CISO, uh, and uh, I, I'd like to get a, a better sense of how much of it was serendipity and, and how much of it was you really setting out kind of a career vision of, of uh, hey, self, that that position of CISO may not exist yet, uh, but oh. uh, uh, I'm going to make some decisions here, here, and here because this is really something I'd like to lead going forward. Yeah, it, it's a long it, it's a long story. I'll give you that the highlights, but something that's very important, I think, um, that uh, you know your students should take away. You should always have your career vision well defined, and revisit that career vision on a regular basis. So I was reassigned. Uh, I was a federal law enforcement officer. Audits were important, but criminal investigations were also a priority of, of my organization. So I was assigned uh, uh, to do workers' compensation fraud investigations for the Postal Service. So when uh, employees would fake injuries to get uh, Department of uh, Labor benefits uh, fraudulently, I would investigate those crimes. And I was sitting back on surveillance on one of the, the claimants that were, was faking a, a back injury. And I was thinking about my career and um, I knew that I didn't want to do surveillance for the next five, six, seven, eight years. Um, I wanted to get in, into cyber. And uh, at that, that evening while I was on surveillance, I defined a role for myself that didn't exist at the time. It was the chief information security officer for the United States Postal Service. I wanted to be the first chief information security officer that carried a gun and a badge to protect a company. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, like I said, it didn't exist. You know, it's not an easy path, but it took me 15 years, and I'll talk a little bit later about how I actually, uh, uh, you know, willed that into being, and, and it's important in, in my career path. But having that vision and understanding where you want to go really provides a lot of internal motivation for yourself, gives you something to reconnect with, but also drives people you interact with, the things that you'll do the adventures that you'll have in your career. And so, um, yeah, I, I think defining that career vision is something that's extremely important. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's really a, a, a way to go forward. I, um, you, you talked about, you know, what was that trajectory then? And uh, one of the things that, um, was very important to me or is very important to me is having a mentor and having someone that's been there, done that, uh, can help you see the way to accomplishment. And I, over the course of my career, I have had an, a lot of mentors. Uh, 
when I was in the dat data center doing the electronic data processing controls audit, uh, I befriended one of my colleagues that showed me how to do programming. And we would spend hours and hours uh, basically writing old uh, mainframe programs in order to be able to, to meet business outcomes in a more efficient and effective way. I had a mentor that was an executive uh, from Washington in the Postal Inspection Service. At the time, I was out in San Francisco, uh, California for, on, on my assignment, and um, we had got befriended from just uh, some interactions that I'd had by going to Washington. And uh, by approaching him and telling him what my career aspirations were and how um, I thought I could add unique value to the organization, he helped me find ways to, to be able to achieve those uh, outcomes. He was, a, he was many levels higher than I was in the organization. It takes a lot of courage to approach um, people that are, are higher in, in you know, your, your particular uh, company to ask them to be a mentor. Lo and behold, 9-11 occurs and the uh, Patriot Act uh, involve or, or defines a set of task forces across the United States. So this is uh, 2001, right after 9-11. Uh, and this uh, leader in Washington calls out to, to San Francisco and says, hey, you need to put Greg on the Secret Service Electronic Crimes Task Force in San Francisco to be able to help them with the mission of electronic crimes. And as a result, I got assigned to just a dream um, uh, assignment from an investigative perspective to, um, to really uh, take my career to the next level. So, you know, I can't understate the importance of having mentors and seeking folks that can really advocate for you. And, you know, you, you offer help to them, they can help you in, in immeasurable ways. So that mentor didn't have to be a CISO, right? It really, no, you know, no. somebody who you could bounce ideas off. I love what you've described in, in business parlance, often it's referred to as a, as a BHAG, right? A big, hairy, audacious goal. What? A CISO at the Postal Service? We've never had that. Yep. Yeah, it's a big goal. It's audacious, but darn it, you can't hit an eagle if you're shooting at snakes every day. Exactly. Uh, and, and you had a senior leader who was willing to regularly on some kind of drum beat meet with you and you could bounce those crazy ideas off of uh, and in a safe space, uh, right, share what what your plans were, what maybe worked or didn't. I, I would imagine they gave you some pacing ideas. Hey, Greg, not so fast. You know, you're yeah, just yeah, yeah. scare leadership off if you if you go run towards that goal. Was that the kind of interaction you had with your mentor? Abs absolutely. You know, taking a realistic, you know, measured approach. Um, obviously, you know, you, as uh, you know, you think that you underestimate what you can you you overestimate what you can do in the short term, but you underestimate what you can do in the long term, right? And um, I think this mentor, you know, this particular mentor that really took me under his wing um, would, would share those kinds of, of thoughts with me. I mean, uh, that's really where we, um, we got a lot of value. So. And I'm sure that he uh, I got a lot of value out of you, right? That that, that uh, probably greatly appreciated the, hey, Greg, help me understand the technology. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And, understand and, why data is important going forward. Uh, yeah. uh, speaking of that, Greg, um, I would imagine that you just didn't sit still with your uh, uh, bachelor's degree uh, and said, oh, that's enough. I'm done. Uh, uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about your uh, the importance of academic partnerships, of, of your continuous learning uh, uh, in that journey to become CISO, but also as a CISO. Yeah, no, great question, uh, David. I So uh, academic partnerships are crucial to, to success, I think, 
in an ever-changing uh, technical landscape. And I did not, uh, I have no degree beyond a bachelor's degree. However, I would befriend professors at major institutions. So uh, taking this experience from uh, San Francisco, uh, I convinced the head of the Secret Service in San Francisco that we needed to develop partnerships with both uh, Stanford University and uh, uh, University of California at Berkeley. These were two just premier or organizations, academic organizations in the area. They do amazing work out there. And I said, hey, we kind have- Kind of the equivalent of Virginia Tech, if you would imagine out in California. Exactly. If, if I was to transplant Virginia Tech, uh, you know, it would be exactly equivalent. Um, and so, uh, you know, this was another situation where, you know, you're taking a little risk. We approached the chair of the electronic, um, electrical engineering and computer science department at Stanford. And we were a couple of law enforcement officers, the head of the secret service office, one of his agents and myself go into Stanford and say, hey, we're trying to take on really important technical problems from a cybersecurity and investigations perspective. Will you work with us? And uh, I began a great relationship as a result of that. Uh, admittedly, when we left, the, one of my secret, the Secret Service colleague, he thought the meeting was a complete bomb. He was like, we showed up in suits. We didn't. Um, you've seen a Secret Service agent, right? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, so, so you were the men in black, and you yes. met with a bunch of grunge uh, uh, hacker culture that said, "Really, Greg?" Yeah, exactly. And and so he thought it was a complete uh, failure this particular meeting. But we got invited back, and I actually got to sit in uh, on a number of classes uh, around. Uh, application security, as well as cryptography. And I befriended the cryptography professor at Stanford. His name's Dan Bonet. He's still out there. And uh, I had the occasion of working uh, one of the uh, earliest mass data compromises of credit card information. Uh, the the uh, Visa International, which is based out in uh, Foster City, California, which is in the Bay Area, approached the Secret Service and said, hey, we think that a hacker has uh, compromised a mail order telephone order credit card processing company. And we want, you know, we, we need your help. And long story short, uh, I was able to uh, get the hacker uh, extradited from Cyprus. He was a Ukrainian national uh, who had uh, was on vacation in Cyprus doing credit card fraud with all of the information that he had stolen. And uh, what was really important was the academic partnership portion of this. Uh, of course, it was great to get to the bottom of uh, the theft of 8.7 million credit card numbers, get the guy extradited back to the United States, get him prosecuted. But I took this problem set to Dan Bonet. And at the time, Dan had been working, uh, a uh, had written some papers on fixed width cryptography and uh, really fashioned how to take that 13 digit uh, card number that was being stored in databases and applying cryptography to it to basically obfuscate the information. And it was really the first push towards tokenization, which is such an important principle in credit card ha uh, handling now. But really it was that collaboration between the work that I was doing, trying to recover uh, the databases of, of these uh, criminals that had hacked into uh, uh, credit card processing companies and uh, and Dan and his research at Stanford, he 
got funding to, to be able to create a company. Uh, the company was uh, uh, called Voltage Security. It was all later sold to, uh, to Hewlett Packard Enterprises, but it was a great example of the importance of public-private partnership and a, a value for academic partnership. And um, again, a, a very uh, similar uh, when, when I was Chief Information Security Officer at the Postal Service, um, I had a similar relationship, uh, uh, an organization very similar to, to Virginia Tech, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I was able to uh, work with their Software Engineering Institute. Uh, SEI, right? SEI. Uh, yep. FFRDC, a federally funded research and development center that has the job to protect software, just as the Secret Service, a lot of people don't know, right? The Secret Service, yep. in addition to protecting the president, has always had the mission of protecting the nation's currency, right? The nation's money. Yep. And so that's why those relationships are so important in understanding the relationship between other organizations. So so at SCI, uh, uh, how did they help you here? So uh, I, I funded about through the federally funded research and development uh, center, uh, I was able to, to uh, send them quite a quite a bit of money i in my tenure as ciso i spent about 10 15 million dollars uh with carnegie mellon and we published a number of papers i have just put the link to to those papers in the uh in the uh, in the uh, chat but we uh they really taught me how to uh, build a mature cybersecurity practice for my organization they have a uh a model that was actually used as the basis of CMMC. It's called the Resilience Management Model, which, which grew out of CMMI, right? The, a, exactly. A model for software that then uh, said, oh, if we did this for software, we can do it for the larger information system. Absolutely. And now the DoD has turned to that and said, you know what? All this NIST stuff is interesting, but I really care about the processes that companies use. Let me pull the scrape from uh, uh, CMMI and help DOD develop the cybersecurity maturity model certification, which includes, oh my goodness, where you started, right? An audit component. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. You, you, you are... Uh... You're, you've gone full circle on me, David, and you know, that's those are examples of I think academic partnerships that were extremely important in my career, and I believe that uh, all the students should really you know get their arms around technology is constantly changing, and I think you started with uh, you know where smart cities are going, where AI ML is going. Uh, the, the, the amount of change that you're going to see over the course of your career is so steep. The, the rate of um, uh, compute and, you know, we're going to, we're going to face quantum. We're going to face so many challenges through the course of your careers that if you don't stay aligned with an academic institution to really keep you on the cutting edge I think you fall behind. There's no way to to really um, stay innovative and up to date on all of the the the, uh, the changing landscape. And, and, and but what I'm also hearing is that as business cyber leaders, right, as as folks that aren't getting cybersecurity as part of a computer science degree, uh, that the organizational relationships are just as important for business cyber leaders, right? Because th they're the ones that are gonna bring into that equation with some smart engineers and some smart IT folks, the system administrators, that uh, set of relationships between, well, what does the Secret Service have to do here? What does the FBI do? What, what, what does uh, SEI uh, uh, from Carnegie Mellon do? Um, uh, uh, so I'm really glad that, that you showed us that, you, you know, keeping both in balance are very important. Greg, let's go see if we have a question or two, and then we'll shift gears and and, and kind of uh, talk about how maybe you spotted opportunity, and then a little bit about uh, 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 current cyber challenges ahead of us. Uh, uh, from the audience, uh, any questions or observations that, that anyone would like to, to share or ask? I don't bite. This is when we stare uncomfortably at our Zoom screen until somebody takes that first bold step. 
Hello. Uh, can I? Okay. Hey, Joseph. Yeah. Hey, kudos to you for, for being that first bold, uh, not so hairy, but definitely <laughs> audacious uh, student to ask a question. So obviously I came late, um, so I missed a couple of it. So, um, so it's something I have a concern of because I know um, we're talking about cybersecurity, and I'm like in the process of like transitioning. So I'm, I'm. It's a name like enterprise cybersecurity. At least that's what my school calls it. But I, don't, I don't know if because I'm trying to pick on your both of y'all's um experience and expertise. If you know anything about that field sort of i don't know why it's called enterprise cyber security but i'm hoping or i'm guessing it's something um pretty similar to something that you've worked with before yeah it, it, it's a great question because we right. flew jargon around all the time and, and i'll just start with what's an enterprise right well the postal service is an enterprise right then the postal service uh, electronic stamps is an enterprise vertical within the postal service. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Greg, uh, help bring enterprise cybersecurity alive for Joseph. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was the chief information security officer in the last several years of my career, I uh, led an effort to make cybersecurity an uh, all of enterprise objective. And so, uh, I convinced the Postmaster General, who's the CEO of the Postal Service, to create an Executive Cyber Risk Committee. And that Executive Cyber Risk Committee consisted of the Chief Human Resources Officer, an organization of 640,000 employees. Uh, that's important. Cyber is an important component to, to the employee community. This, the uh, Chief Financial Officer, so being able to articulate the need for investments and those risk decisions that need to be made by the organization, the, the chief financial officer had to be on that committee. The, the uh, vice president of supply management. So uh, I would tell her early and often that the next cyber at attack on the postal service or any pro enterprise is going to involve a partner, a business partner. We don't build technology, we procure technology. Somewhere along that technology line is going to be a business partner that is going to be compromised if we're going to be compromised, whether it's Microsoft or a defense contractor that we contract with, you name it. Uh, also, uh, the deputy hey, Greg, to, to the last point, uh, right? Invariably, for any service organization, as you provide service to other enterprises, there's an overlap of your information environments, right? And so Absolutely. you led the postal enterprise, but one of your customers might be a shipping company that uses a lot of stamps, a lot of postage that regularly page postal service for that postage and other kinds of things. At some point, there's an, an overlap between your information environments that means that those two enterprise cyber programs need to recognize there's an enduring relationship and there's shared risk in that overlap. Is, is that right? Ab absolutely. Great point, David. So we would tout that the postal service, the U.S. Postal Service is at the center of a $900 billion industry. And Amazon is, you know, was one of our great success stories when when Jeff Bezos, when he was starting out in the late 90s, could drive up to the uh, bulk mail center in, in Seattle, Washington and drop off a few books that he had sold on the Internet um, and then build that into a complete enterprise that, you know, ran on the backbone of the Postal Service for so many years before he created his own delivery capability. I think that's a great example, David, of those business connections. And so uh, we literally managed 40,000 business connections with customers uh, from you know, some of the largest mailing organizations to some of the smallest mom and pop folks that just needed to, to market their, uh, their company. So your incident response and incident recovery uh, really was a shared thing between you and those involved uh, uh, customers. I, I, Joseph, I, I also want to 
you know, bring this down to where the, the students are, because you may, as you graduate from uh, our programs here, um, very few of you will write into where Greg finished up, right? Very few will go right as the CISO in charge of, uh, you know, the Postal Service, but you will go into an enterprise. And that enterprise may just be a business unit within a much larger company. Well, that business unit is also an enterprise. And so it's so important to be able to establish what's your cyber universe. And that smaller enterprise that you then join and become a cyber leader for, uh, uh, taking a step back and defining that cyber universe for your enterprise uh, is very important. And many leaders don't do that. They don't get to that. But that can really help distinguish you from some of the competition uh, as you begin to really understand cyber risk early on in your career. Uh, to to link that that universe with your enterprise slice. Uh, is, is there another question or or observation? We're, we're going to shift gears into um, uh, some current cyber challenges, uh, but let's see if there's another question. Uh, one question. Hey, um, hey. Uh, so I have a pretty similar background um, from where he started. Um, being more the organizational side of the business, a little bit of accounting, finance, how it operates. So now that I'm kind of taking more of a focus into cybersecurity, um, do you have any specific positions or uh, career paths that I should be taking a look to as it is kind of a big jump moving in from kind of an overall perspective to a specific department, so to speak, um, especially one that might be similar in my current role where I kind of overlook everything and um, more of a, I guess, organizational perspective than uh, maybe like network management or something more specific of that nature? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Jay. I think that um, coming from a technical background or uh, from an accounting business background, there is a huge need in organizations to be able to manage risk. And uh, there's, I had a, a big team of uh, information security system uh, officers that ISSOs that would uh, evaluate system controls to identify whether a particular application should be uh, operating on the network. So and you created so, a pyramid, right? From the CISO, you had your ISSOs. Those ISSOs, maybe even down the line, uh, had some technicians with responsibilities. You could exactly. not have covered the cyber universe, the scope of something as large as the Postal Service, without creating that pyramid of people, but also roles and responsibilities at each level of the pyramid and the, the range of internal controls that you wanted each to cover? Absolutely. My organization, when I left the Postal Service, was 450 cybersecurity professionals focused only on being able to protect the business. Uh, risk management and these information security officers were extremely important to be aligned with the business objectives of each of the portfolios that drove uh, business applications for the organizations. For example, there was the finance set of applications that attended to all of the uh, financial matters of the Postal Service, the, the business applications that manage the accounts payable, the accounts receivable, uh, you know, all of that uh, uh, work. And then, you know, there was the applications that supported the marketing organization and uh, bringing on customers and the whole uh, customer engagement to, uh, to, to be able to, to, you know, service literally every address in the United States every day. And so, Jay, the, the, the understanding that you have of business controls to be able to support the business is extremely important uh, set of skills. I uh, and, and in demand, right? To, to take those exactly. skills with cyber savvy, uh, there's a real need for that, right? Yeah, I, I, I applaud trying to get more technical, you know, becoming a... Uh, system admin or a, a network engineer or an architect. However, you know, I think that there's a lot of value that you can provide to the information, to an information security practice uh, by just sharing the, um, the business acumen that you've developed through your current experience and the education that you're getting through this program. Yeah. And Greg, I, I would just add, 
uh, uh, Jay, be ready to be a leader uh, because at some point, if if you're going up the business track for cyber, it, it, it's not your ability to, 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 to find that one hack that no one else could find. It's your ability to lead that team that Greg described, right? That to, to be able to lead several ISSOs and to uh, uh, have cyber auditors, but also cyber technicians and a SOC that works for you. Uh, so uh, along the way, don't forget to feed that that leadership, knowledge, skills, and abilities a, a, a part of you. Hey, Greg, let's shift gears a little bit, uh, and, and we'll come back to some questions if we have time at the end. But would love to look forward at at some of the cyber challenge. And we talked ahead of time about uh, this election and and sure. how how are uh, we as a nation uh, uh, addressing cyber threats to uh, democracy? Uh, and what what have we learned? What do we still need to learn? Can, can you talk a little bit about that? I could talk forever on this. It's, in about ten minutes, <laughs> five to ten. In, a, in about ten minutes. So uh, I had the great experience in 2020 of being able to protect uh, the mail-in ballots for the nation. And so at the time in 2020, if you take a step back, uh, we were in the middle of COVID. Uh, the vaccine had not rolled out yet. Uh, we were in a situation where uh, uh, election authorities were trying to figure out how are we going to safely administer the, the uh, election across all of the, the jurisdictions of the United States. Uh, the Postal Service, um, although it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal, is the only provider of services to every election th authority in the United States. And so, so that's a federal, state, local, all rely on the Postal Service. Exactly. And, and so we have a very unique relationship. And obviously, uh, election authorities turned to the Postal Service in order to be able to uh, allow mail-in ballots. In, um, uh, in March of, of 2020, uh, we had a bit of a, um, a concern. Uh, the, the president of the United States expressed concern about the security of the mail-in ballot process. Uh, that raised red flags all over the place in, in uh, my organization. And we needed strong leadership in order to be able to come in and give assurance that uh, the systems that we have in place can handle uh, the uh, the, administr the administration of the election process. And so I started uh, going back to one of, you know, kind of core to Jay's uh, questions and points, an in-depth system analysis. And I, I actually had started this two years prior. I did not do this in March of 2020. It, it was actually a research effort that had been going on for a couple of years, really looking at all of the interdependencies of the technology assets of the Postal Service that were necessary in order to deliver the election. And um, I don't have time to talk about it in depth here, but uh, uh, I did a research project trying to bring blockchain into the election administration processes of the Postal Service. That's for a separate day in discussion if you want to talk innovation. But um, that system analysis was extremely important to be able to understand the systems of systems that David was talking about that are necessary in order for assuring that every ba ballot on the outbound side receive, is received at its destination, that every ballot on the inbound side gets uh, received by an election authority, the amount of technology assets from an operational technology. Now, and we talk a lot about IT technology. I assume you know about operational technology. The Postal Service uh, uh, leverages uh, about 250 uh, processing plants across the United States. 
These are warehouse size buildings that have masses of pieces of technology that are designed to sort letters to the delivery destination. These pieces of equipment are like football uh, uh, field sized pieces of automation equipment that sort. So if you're going to do election fraud at scale, that's the kind of the center that you probably look at and say, oh, I can influence a lot of ballots here exactly. at the sorting centers. Absolutely. If, if somebody was able to redirect ballots, that would be a real issue, right? And so we, uh, we did a variety of different analysis techniques to make sure that the security of each of the systems that uh, we relied upon in the systems of systems, we knew the vulnerabilities, we addressed those vulnerabilities, we managed the risk. And, you know, of course, you identify vulnerabilities along the way, and you've got to address those, you've got to make the, the investments that are necessary in order to mitigate those uh, vulnerabilities. And, and um, you know, that was really a, a, a big exercise. And when it came to that last two month push, I had the opportunity to work with the newly formed CISA organization. And my buddy, Chris Krebs, uh, welcomed the Postal Service uh, in with open arms to the, the command center that he had established in CISA to be able to monitor all of those nation state threats that uh, were very present. And, you know, I, I can go in more detail about this, but, you know, in the 2016 election, you know, there was a lot of uh, attacks on social media that were being made relative to misinformation, disinformation around uh, the election process and, and uh, you name it. You know, we're six years later now, the use of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence by our adversaries is a, uh, a national threat. And we need to understand, um, you know, in social networks, whether it's Facebook or uh, uh, even TikTok or, or Instagram, we need to understand how bots are being used and leveraged by adversaries uh, who have machine learning and, and artificial intelligence at their avail to know that you're actually interacting with a human that's made a comment and not a bot that is trying to inflame an issue. Um, so, so sometimes the ampli amplification of a malicious narrative in and of itself is a cyber attack. It's not absolutely. a cyber attack that we would think of in the sense of ones and zeros, but it's a bot driven amplification, uh, 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 utilizing uh, uh, malicious uh, techniques to advance the goals of another nation vis-a-vis -vis our democracy. Yeah, trust was at the core of, of my role at the United States Postal Service as a federal law enforcement officer for 25 years. Uh, I think that was one of the most important things that I delivered on a day in and day out basis. I think it's one of the most important things that a, a CISO delivers for his or her organization. And um, when you even get a suggestion of uh, a problem in, you know, a Pennsylvania or wherever, um, you know, even the suggestion really makes you as a information security practitioner have to address those allegations with integrity and with evidence to show that this, the controls that you've put in place have, uh, you know, provide for all of those, you know, audit controls, thinking about back to the order complete, accurate, reliable, all of those types of, of, dis, uh, of principles uh, that are necessary in order to be able to prove that you are administering one of the, or the most secure election uh, that's been run. Uh, long story short, um, you know, we, we had a number of uh, nation state uh, issues that we needed to address. Um, uh, the Postal Service uh, was able to deliver 45% uh, of the general election 
uh, from a mail-in ballot perspective, which was over 70 million ballots. 45% of the votes cast in the 2020 election were by mail. 45%, yes. Yeah, pretty important uh, responsibility. Absolutely. And so, you know, that was one of my most important contributions uh, if, for, in my career. Well, Chris Krebs gave you a great grade, right? Because Chris Krebs, <laughs> the, the political appointee from the last administration responsible for the security of the elections, called it the most secure vote that Amer in American history. Uh, uh, and and I, I guess he was a big part of it to you and the Postal Service. Yeah, we, we were grateful to have a, a great re relationship. Obviously, there's 17,000 election authorities across the United States. And the work that Chris Krebs did with all of the states and municipalities that administer elections is a massive effort. Uh, I think he he invested in the right ways in order to be able to to mitigate those those uh, vulnerabilities and and really bring the nation together to administer that. So you know, I, I, I have it's business savvy and leadership to, to this as well. So as you organized the post office around tiers of cyber leaders working for you, Chris did the same thing, right, with uh, uh, cyber security professionals at the state level, at the local level, so that we were looking at cyber at every layer of this election. Absolutely. And going forward, uh, the threats don't rest, right? As you described, we're, we're, we're now into these uh, internet amplification attacks and uh, the same US entities are working with Facebook, they're working with TikTok, they're working with uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, uh, so th this never gets old, does it? No, uh, not at all. I, I administered a, um, a, a panel uh, two weeks ago. I had the uh, Director of Intelligence for Cy US Cyber Command uh, and um, uh, the FBI agent that, that's responsible for uh, 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 malicious attacks from the Russian GRU and uh, Facebook and Google uh, threat analysts. Um, and literally we were talking about this very issue. How do we police the activities of nation state actors uh, in protecting the election and other interests in the United States. And I think that um, this is going to be a, a, a problem set and narrative that will extend in well into your careers. And, um, you know, I, th I think that um, you're going back to that service uh, for those of you that are interested in government service. And, you know, the, the, this public private partnership, you mentioned Facebook and Google is as important to, to all of this, you know, even service within those organizations is extremely important in order to be able to uh, assure truth in um, the administration of elections or just in the narrative of social uh, uh, issues. Greg, we are at the hour and time has flown. Uh, and uh, boy, this is all fascinating. And, and I would love to be able to spend uh, an hour more with you. But uh, uh, I want to thank you so much on behalf of Virginia Tech, on behalf of Pamplin uh, and uh, NVCC. Uh, our two programs uh, really appreciate you taking the time tonight to, to speak with us. I should share with all the students and the faculty that Greg has agreed to be on our advisory council at, uh, for our two-year, four-year cybersecurity program. So uh, you, you, it won't be the last you see or hear or feel from his influence, uh, I, I can assure you. Um, uh, Greg, if you have uh, five minutes afterwards, uh, uh, I'd love for maybe you and I to stay online after somebody uh, or any uh, one that has a question or wants to hear other pe uh, other people's questions. Uh, but but I do want to close on time for those that that need to put kids to bed or uh, uh, finish a late dinner. Um, thank you so much for participating in this tonight, uh, 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 students and faculty, uh, and uh, have a great night. Uh, let's segue over. Is there a question or, or comment from the group? Anybody? Yeah, David, thank you so much for the opportunity. This was uh, this was great. I look forward to, to supporting both Nova and Virginia Tech in, in your pursuit to, to really uh, uh, bring these disciplines into uh, into the future. Yeah. Hey, Joseph, uh, uh, thanks so much. Uh, uh, you got a follow up? Yes, yeah, so I'm as, as I've um, said before, I'm still a student. So I guess 
what's your biggest advice to students in cyber? Oh man, <laughs> well, it's, I'd start with keep your head on a swivel, right? I'll always be scanning, I'll always be looking. You've got to be curious. If you're not curious, cyber is probably not for you. But uh, uh, Greg, what what would you uh, uh, give uh, Joseph? Are, are you just starting in the uh, the Nova part of the program? The first um, two years. I'm at Nova. Yep, I'm at Nova. Um, Great. Yep. What if would I, your advice, uh, uh, Greg, be for a, a student just starting out in the first two years that a uh, that uh, pursuit of an associates in uh, business cyber? Yeah, I think it's look for opportunities to learn and grow. I think that uh, understanding the problems that uh, are presented in cybersecurity is extremely important. So, uh, you know, everything that you can bring in through your academics and uh, trying to apply them in uh, the real world is extremely important. Um, and recognize that there's a lot of um, there are a lot of uh, uh, analogies that can be drawn to uh, learn in not even cyber incidents. Um, my my son's a sophomore at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University uh, and uh, in Fort Myer, Florida. So he has been spending the day uh, uh, in his uh, apartment. Uh, buttoned down due to the hurricane. And one of the things that we're really talking about is the importance of understanding incident response and after action reporting. And so, um, you know, using those types of real world situations as metaphors for what you need to do in cyber is extremely important. So you interact with technology every day, Joseph, you're on social media, you know, understand how your friends uh, social media uh, accounts are being taken over or um, how, you know, the narrative is being drawn from, from social, some social media aspect. There's so many things to be curious about and learn. Um, you know, that's my biggest uh, recommendation to you. Yeah. And Justin, if I would just add one more thing, and that's do exactly what you did tonight. Speak up. There are so many introverts that are attracted to cybersecurity and get heads down in really important problems. But those individuals that can articulate cyber concepts to a layman audience that can put things into business terms and really describe risk to others, those are where the leaders are chosen from. So take advantage of your time in class. Whenever you have an opportunity to ask a question, get in there and ask it. Use that as an exercise, a personal exercise to be able to communicate confidently uh, uh, using the right cyber terms. And you won't always get it right. You'll sometimes ask an embarrassing question, uh, but you'll learn from that. And much better to do that in an academic environment uh, than to uh, uh, do that in a business environment. So keep on asking questions, keep on speaking up in class. Uh, those are really good things to do. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Great questions. Uh, Khalid, I see Khalid's got a, a question here. Do you need, uh, uh, security clearance to do work in cyber? Uh, no is the short answer. Uh, the long answer is obviously there are some federal agencies that require security clearances, some uh, contra defense contractors that are doing work on behalf of the government that, that where you need a security clearance, but there are vast numbers of uh, private sector organizations that do not require a security clearance. Uh, you know, from a due diligence perspective, every company should be doing a good background investigation on their employees to, from a trust pers perspective. But, uh, you know, th that's not the level of, um, of a security clearance. So- and, and Khalid, I would offer, there are very few uh, individuals around the world that can perform high-end cybersecurity and also speak Arabic. Uh, uh, and one of the, the words I learned in my regular interactions with cyber professionals in the Middle East was shafafia, uh, uh, or, or that concept of transparency. And so uh, uh, for those that might not be in a position to qualify for a U.S. security clearance, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't be insanely valuable to an import export company that really needs cyber on both ends, that needs to be able to communicate cyber uh, 
controls to the part of their uh, uh, global business that just happens to be in the Arabic world. Uh, so yeah, no, you don't. Are, are there positions uh, like up at Fort Meade? Uh, yeah, absolutely, working at the Secret Service. Yeah, you need a clearance. But there's so many other uh, needs for cybersecurity professionals that uh, uh, maybe are foreign nationals or or have come to the U.S. under a, a different kind of situation. That uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't slow down at all. I would run to get your cyber uh, uh, degree and then use your understanding of other cultures and other languages and it's an asset. Khalid, did we get to the heart of the question? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that was a perfect answer. Thank you. Great. Hey, uh, uh, Greg, uh, David has a question. David uh, Valladares. Yep. What do you say of someone that has a strong passion about cybersecurity and does not have an impressive academic passion is there opportunity for success absolutely now uh, i have i have to admit i have no degree in cybersecurity. my only certification was with uh, carnegie mellon university i got a uh, executive certificate in uh, as a uh, certified chief information security officer however uh, you always have to be learning uh, this field is moving so fast and technology is changing at such a great rate that uh, you have to have that um, uh, that mindset that you're always going to be learning through through your career. Now, to get an entry level cybersecurity job, you know, I've been talking to a lot of organizations about dropping the need for a four-year degree. I think, you know, the NOVA program that you may be in or the Virginia Tech program that you're in is a great starting point. I think that uh, you need to look for internships that can get you into uh, an entry-level position. For example, inside a security operations center is a great place to start. Uh, there's nothing like looking at all of the indicators that are coming off of the technical equipment and looking for those indicators of compromise so that you can um, assure that the assets of the organization are properly protected. Technician kind of roles, right? Log review. Exactly. Like Absolutely. I, I think that's a great place for you to start looking for those opportunities and, you know, uh, security uh, operations center analysts are in, in significant need. Uh, so, you know, I think that that would be a great uh, place to start. And then you look for, for other opportunities. If, if you enjoy the penetration side of the penetration testing side of the business, that's always a fun place to get into. And, you know, what most people think about when they're doing cyber uh, cybersecurity, but there's, it's such a wide range of, of, of talents. Um, and there are a lot of different roles in cyber as well. I had the opportunity yesterday to um, address the um, women in United Women Uniting Women in Cyber uh, Conference. It was 150 women that uh, are passionate about promoting uh, women in cyber, and it was put on by the Cyber Guild. Great event, and. Uh, we need more women in the field of cybersecurity. Uh, but one of the most important things that I shared was the need to bring in uh, individuals that are not traditional cybersecurity experts, but have uh, expertise in related fields, uh, whether that's uh, in the customer side of the business and understanding identity and access management for your organization, or whether it's in the supply management side of the business and understanding how to do contracts and bring on uh, contract resources, or in the human resources side of the business so that you know how to train and educate your workforce. And so uh, taking what you already do and applying it in creative ways to the cybersecurity field are exactly where I think you can get a lot of, provide a lot of value, 
um, and you know uh, find your way into the field. I, I apologize for being so long winded with that response, but no, it's uh, great. I, I, I don't believe in it. No, I, I appreciate the answer, honestly. I mean, it's just, I just had the question because it is due to my personal experience. Uh, technically, just like a short story, right? I mean, a, an a foreign student that came here to the United States and then I started like, I've been working and going to school at the same time. So during the way I got interested in the cybersecurity field. So right now I'm here at the Blacksburg campus and I mean, I'm honest with myself to the point that, I mean, I don't have a strong uh, academic background. Like I'm trying to do and study like when I can, you know, because technically like due to my work and my personal responsibilities, I mean, I, I have to work, but I try to do my best in the classes. So technically I just had that, I just have that inquiry because technically, I mean, I, I don't have an impressive academic background that I can say, you know, having like, like a high GPA or something like that. But I do have the passion to learn more about cybersecurity and apply it, you know, in the long run, not just for me, but it can be for my family, my friends, you know, even the world. I mean, if it's possible. So it's just, it, it, it's just a question that I had. So, yeah. David, it's a great question. And and your career is, is a journey and it's a long one. Uh, and, you know, parts of your career, as you said, are really establishing a foundation for your kids but after you or, or, or the job, not the first job you're going to have, but the job next and the job after that. While you're in school, uh, I would not obsess about a 4.0 or about grades, uh, but really focus on your on your personal learning. Uh, are, are you getting the most that you can personally at, out of each class? Uh, it, and uh, every class is there for a reason, right? So you really can't or shouldn't blow off any particular class, but you should really seek to get that, that minimum element of why did they put this class in the curriculum? Do I understand it enough so that I can build from that? And over a four-year uh, uh, career, you will find that there are some classes that really ignite a, a different kind of passion in you. And, and I guarantee you, you're going to find that right niche where your passion, your capabilities, your 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 hard work, uh, uh, both uh, all three align, uh, and and you're going to be successful in this career field. I, 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 I've no doubt. As long as you keep that positive energy uh, and never give up. Yep. No, I mean, I do appreciate the answer. I mean, if we go to about the fourth year, I mean, technically I have been going to school almost for seven years. Because <laughs> I, can be, I mean, I have been, I mean, I haven't had the possibility to be like a full-time student every year. So, I mean, I have to accommodate with the classes and the school, but yeah. I mean, and right now it's like my last semester in college. So, I mean, I'm just excited that I'm almost done, but then at the same time, I'm worried about getting a position, oh, you know, so it's just like, happy and then concerned at the same time but i mean i appreciate the feedback honestly yeah, yeah. yeah. david I, I wish you the very best and uh, love to have you work for me someday <laughs> yeah keep your passion buddy keep your passion that's what drives you through your career hey okay. Greg, uh you've been very gracious with your time tonight uh, and i really again want to thank you thank you for this extra little bonus time uh in answering questions uh and uh, uh I, I guess we can kind of call it uh, uh, wraps here. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll request permission from Svetlana though. Okay, but uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Debbie. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right.